Yeah, hi there, and uh, welcome to the Christian War Room here at uh, Seismic Radio, BPN Radio. Uh, today I want to talk about um, an aspect which maybe, you know, if you are a seasoned Christian and you've been around the block once or twice, it is um, it is nothing new to you, and, and you probably could switch off right now and it'll be okay. But if you are not sure about this whole Christianity thing, and... Uh, and you don't fully understand, you know, what's going on and, 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 you know, what this is all about. It might be worthwhile for you to listen, but also, I mean, we're talking about the Christian war room here. So it's, we are here to oppose anything, you know, which exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That's what we are here for. And that's what the Christian war room is all about to highlight ideas, concepts, uh, crazy concepts, which, which rise themselves up or raise themselves up against the knowledge of God. And uh, and again, when we talk about the knowledge of God, it's all Bible-related, the knowledge we have got and we have got access to in the Word of God, which is a Bible. Okay, not the Quran, not the uh, Bhagavad Vita or whatever it is called, what the Hindus have. It's not the Buddhist scripts, it's not the Zoroastrians, but it's the knowledge of God as as we have it. And... I want to talk about something, and it's, it's pretty much the whole concept of darkness and light. Uh, start off the story with, um, with an experience I've had about 30 years ago. I was uh, in Pakistan for three months, and uh, and that was about 30 years ago. So the infrastructure, um, I'm not sure what it's like today. I haven't been for a long time, but it may not be quite as good as um, or it was then possibly not quite as good as what it is today. But one of the things you had pretty frequently is you had power cuts. And you never knew, really. Sometimes you knew when they were coming, but sometimes it just came randomly. And it was just uh, that they were saving on energy. Uh, they had a few, I think, as I understand, a few reservoirs. And and if the water levels got a bit down, they they started to economize. And in certain areas, they switched the power off. Anyway, I was coming from uh, um, the south of Pakistan, and I was going back to the north where I was staying, or the middle of Pakistan, and the place was Taxila. If you know the country, you might know the area. So it's just in the north of Punjab, and uh, there was the um, one highway which went uh, all the way you know, from the center of Pakistan, and from there it was going to Peshawar, and then to um, towards Kabul, I think, uh, towards the Khyber, Khyber Pass. And um, and anyway, we stopped, you know, just at the, not a crossroads, but at the, um, you know, the center of town where Taxila was. And then we still had to walk for about three, four miles. Now, when the bus arrived, it was, and it's traveling in those days was a bit, um, a little bit, uh, how shall I say, you couldn't really plan for it. Yeah, You had the government buses, they were a little bit more expensive, but they were very much, uh, they were subsidized. They didn't care. They would just very much, um, uh, you know, stick to a timetable. And you could pretty much plan when you would arrive at your destination. But then you had the private buses, and they would only carry on driving when they were full. So they would turn up somewhere, and they would, uh, you know, canvas for passengers. And if it needed an hour, it was an hour. If it, uh, you know, needed five minutes, it was five minutes. But it would only carry on once it was full. And, and obviously, they tried to maximize on, on the money they could make. So uh, they were a little bit cheaper, uh, but you had to wait uh, at times. So anyway, I was in one of those private buses and um, with, a, with a friend of mine, a companion who was traveling with me. And, um, and we, unfortunately, arrived in Taxila sometime in the middle of the night. So it was like, I, I don't know, maybe 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning. I don't remember ex- the exact time, but it was the middle of the time. Um, and then the next bit was that it was new moon. So there was no moonlight in the sky. I think it was slightly cloudy as well. There were a few stars you could see, but uh, but not many. And uh, and we were sort of walking up the road again. It was uh, on foot, maybe about three miles. We had to walk, possibly a bit more. And suddenly, you know, about halfway up the road, um, and it's, it's bearing in mind, Pakistan, even at the time, uh, was a bit dangerous. There were a lot of people who were in dire straits, and the temptation is there to just rob somebody if they can get away with it. I mean, the law did work, and if they caught somebody, they had serious consequences. But, but anyway, this was the middle of the night, so suddenly all the lights went off. All the lights went off. And, um, and I was shocked. 
Yeah, there's no traffic on the road, so there was wasn't any lights from cars or trucks or anything. Um, there was nothing, um, nothing there. Yeah, the lights just went off, went dark, and uh, and it was like literally like somebody switched off the light, and you were you had to walk. I mean, you couldn't just stand there, uh, so you had to walk or carry on walking, and um, and you couldn't see a thing. You couldn't see a thing. That was, I wouldn't say utter darkness, but it was, was very serious darkness. Okay, how does the story carry on? Right, so what we did is, uh, my companion didn't speak English very well. My, my uh, Urdu or Punjabi, even though I did speak a bit, was very limited. Uh, so he just motioned to me to, to walk close to him, and we walked right in the center of the road, trying to, to see as much as we could. Um, the interesting thing is your eyes get actually used to the darkness and um, obviously your pupils dilate and, and all that and try to, you know, even the tiniest amount of light to put, put it in. But all the street lighting, you know, the domestic lighting and everything was on. Because it was the middle of the night, so people didn't have um, uh, that, that sort of these kerosene eye lumps, so there was nothing there. And it was dark. It was very, very dark. And it was very, very scary as well, because if somebody, somebody could have walked right behind me and hit me on the head, I wouldn't have seen it. Anyway, the eyes slowly di diluted, um, the pupils, yeah, and, and even though there was just a tiny, mini bit of starlight coming through the mist or the, the clouds which were there, it was either new moon or the moon was, um, you know, set up, but there was no moonlight there. So suddenly you could just make out shapes and, <clears throat> and, um, You could see a tiny amount, not much, but a tiny amount. And um, it was quite an experience. I never had this experience like that before because wherever you are in the West, you, you always have got some light. You either have got light by your car or you've got, um, I mean, when I think about England or Germany because it's so densely populated. Um, so even if you are somewhere where there is nothing there, you uh, and for example, you've got cloud cover, you've got a, a town inevitably nearby somewhere um, within the you know on this side of the horizon and some of the street lights say shine against the clouds and and some of it gets reflected so there's always a little bit of light there and there's always I mean stargazers they call it light pollution and um, because it stops you from th seeing you know dim stars and, and things like that you, you need total darkness for that to here on earth to to be able to see uh, weak starlight in the in the sky but anyway what was what was happening sort of we were just trundling along and um, there were sort of two things in one instance um, you know dogs were freaking out as well there were a lot of wild dogs in that area and uh, whenever they obviously they smelled us they heard us they heard our steps so they started barking and you didn't know whether they were vicious or not And eventually there was a dog just trotting away behind me. And that, that kind of scared me. I thought the dog's going to attack me. So I had my little back and I was ready to defend myself. But, um, but when I sort of realized what was happening, the dog was just as irritated as everybody else. And he just didn't know what to do. And he just started trotting behind us. And he was a good dog, no problems, nothing at all. And then eventually he realized that, uh, we aren't his masters or, you know, had nothing to do with him. So he, uh, he trailed off. Um, then one more thing which kind of struck me is, um, is you know, when you suddenly get some light. I remember in one instance there was a, a truck coming through on the road, and obviously the lights were on. And, um, and because your eyes were used to this darkness, um, the brightness of the light was just very irritating. And then obviously the, the truck went by, and so we went on the side of the road making sure it wouldn't run over us. And, um, and then it, uh, it would... Um, you know, your eyes would need some time to sort of adjust themselves, uh, you know, back to the darkness. Okay, w why am I telling you all this? Now, what we have, and I'm going to go to a scripture in a minute, what we have is, um, and this is a big problem, we've got something which is like a spiritual darkness, a spiritual darkness in our lives. And, and that is where the Christian war room comes in as well. We need to, that's our job really, to, to help people to, first of all, Be prepared to see the light. I mean, when this truck was coming along with this bright light, yeah, um, the temptation, not the temptation, the, the natural reaction was to look away from it because it was quite painful to look into this light. And I think that is what a lot of people are doing today when spiritually they see the divine light, they see Jesus Christ, and they see what he stands for. 
the people are just tempted to look away. They they can't take it, and they don't really want to see this. They are more used to the darkness, and they feel, after some time, comfortable with the darkness, and they don't want to see Jesus. And so they shy away from it, and they go away, and maybe even tell him to go away, and they carry on in their darkness, spiritual darkness. Okay, um, let me just elaborate a little bit on this point. Uh, we've got, um, obviously we've got physical eyesight, and, and when we, if a person has got fully, is fully sighted and can see very well, our lives are pretty much built around our eyesight. We've got other senses as well. We've got the sense of, uh, you know, the touch, warmth. Uh, we can hear, we can smell, we can taste. But predominantly, it's probably the hearing and the seeing, which is very important for us and where, um, you know, a lot of our our lives is built around. And it's quite interesting as well when you look at it from an engineering point of view. Uh, whatever we see is only a fraction of what is out there. When you look at the, the spectrum of light, uh, and you go into infrared and to ultraviolet, there are worlds of light out there which we cannot see. And we need, today we know this, and past days it didn't, but we need special equipment to to see into the ultraviolet spectrum or the infrared spectrum. And and the stuff we can see is just a tiny, a tiny slither of the light spectrum that is out there. And um, anyway, that's just one thing on the side, you know, just to make the point. Spiritually, it's very similar. Uh, I think we are almost totally blind because we are just living in darkness and, um, and we can't figure things out ourselves. We need somebody to illuminate what is going on. Uh, and it's the same when I was walking in, in Taxila. I knew the road very well. I'd been walking this road many times, so I knew where what was and uh, roughly where the houses were, where they stopped, where the fields were, and sometimes you, in the darkness you could see shades. And I was sort of familiar with um, where I was, but because I'd seen it in the light. Uh, I'd seen it in the light, whereas somebody else would have been completely oblivious if they had never been there, if ne- they had never seen what was there in the light. So it's very important to to to, to see the light or to see things in daylight uh, to be able to navigate around when it's totally dark or when there's only very little, very marginal light left. Uh, I want to go to a scripture now, and um, and it sort of describes pretty much what is going on. And it's um, Gospel of John, it's the first chapter, and it starts off, In the beginning was a word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Okay. So this talks about Jesus. Uh, It says that, you know, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, Very philosophical, and uh, I'm going to go in this right now. Uh, He was in the beginning with God, talks about Jesus. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life. The life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And that is the light, you know. The light shines into the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So a little bit what what happened when, when I was on the road, and I think spiritually it happens with a lot of people. If they see the light of Christ, uh, they cannot comprehend it. it. It irritates them, and they look away, and they don't want to see. They maybe close their eyes because they are not... They're not bothered about it. They don't want to know. They tr- they try to get away. It's it's painful uh, when you see what you suppose is there, but you're not quite sure because you're walking in darkness. And uh, it says here, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was a true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. And he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe on his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Um, So again, we are talking about this relationship with with the light. 
It is very simple. Yeah? Jesus is the light. He has come into this world. He came into his own. His own wasn't ready to receive him. And we, we see this today. A lot of people just don't want to know about Jesus. They don't want to know about him. They just don't want to know about him. But those who believe on his name, and this is sort of very, very simple. It's not those who, you know, do a pilgrimage to Jerusalem or Mecca or or go the Jacob's way or, or, or anything like that. It's nothing like that. It's only those who believe on his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And they become children of God, those who believe on his name, yeah? born of God. So that's very, very important. That is the light, the light of man. Okay, let me just um, sort of elaborate a little bit on this. And let's, let's look a little bit of what is darkness and what is light in this world. Uh, and again, we are talking about spiritual darkness. Um, with my own eyes, yeah, this is without any divine knowledge or revelation or whatever, there are certain things I can see in this world. I can see that there is something which is going terribly wrong. I can see that there is evil, and I can see that there is good in this world as well. Yeah, they are compassionate people and, and so on. I remember when I was in Africa, um, you get a lot of people who are heavily into the occult, very wicked people, people who just place curses on other people all day and, and um, mess about with demons and things like that. Yeah, Very, very wicked. But on the other side, I've, I've, the kindest people I've ever met in this world, I've met them in Africa as well. So you get a little bit of both extreme, really kind, good, warm-hearted people, and you get really nasty people as well. And obviously, you find this in every culture, and you find this wherever you go. You get good people, you get b- bad people, yeah. and and that's a little bit like good and evil, which is which you see in this world, and it can be seen quite quite vividly, where um, where both of these things are just present, and and we can see them every day. The Chinese they call it yin and yang, and and they've got a concept that you know uh, because of evil, you know we know what good is. It's a bit. Because there's light, and the absence of light is darkness, so we can differentiate one from the other. And they've got sort of similar ideas. You know? uh, I mean, Paul picks up on this in, in Romans, in the letter to the Romans, uh, where the Gnostics, they, they got some crazy idea where they said, okay, let us do evil that good may result. Um, and, and partly they understand this with the, con- with the contrast. So if somebody is getting murdered, which is bad, yeah, but then somebody rescue somebody and save somebody's life this is good but we only know that it is good and we start appreciating it because we we can see the the other side as well the dark side and so in their philosophy they need both they need they need the dark side to understand the good side um obviously the the christian perspective is slightly different i mean paul says you know this is total rubbish and he, he um reprimands this concept in, in Romans, check it out, read the first couple of chapters in, in Romans, and then uh, he picks up on these philosophies which are there. But um, we have evil in this world, and we've got darkness in this world, and we can see this. We can see this with our own eyes. And then obviously we can define our own moral code to try and fight evil and do good and to encourage other people to, to do good. Um, yet what we find in the past is that this moral code uh, outside from God and apart from God becomes very difficult. Uh, so we find with the Spartans that that they were penalized not for stealing but for being caught for stealing, you know, because they didn't do it, you know, sly enough. Or we find that um, that in the Nazi era we had an interesting moral code where um, certain people or certain group of people could be murdered, could be abused, and it was okay. They were outside the law at, at some point. We find this in communism as well, that um, it was okay to execute people who are not with the state or perceived to be not 100% with the state. Um, And so a lot of people, some people say up to 20 million people died. We we see this with Pol Pot and others where if people don't go along with the leadership or the leadership thinks they're not going along, they've got a carte blanche to just murder and kill them. Um, So that is is, is clearly evil. And it's dark, it's very, very dark, but, but that's a moral codex, and they consider it for being good. Now, what does the Bible say? And, and um, again, we need to get this concept across. Yeah? The Bible says that we need the light. We need the light of Christ in our lives to really understand what is good, 
to to get an understanding of how this world ticks and and what makes this world go around and um and to then live a life which is good and pleasing to god and hopefully pleasing to everybody else around us as well you know where we are benevolent and kind and good and and the way to do this is and again let me just explain the gospel and and try and to remember this as well to to pass on to others the first one is and and the um John is quite clear on this, and he says that there are a couple of things you have to do. Is you have to believe in his name, and you have to receive him. Yeah, it says here in verse 12, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe on his name. So you believe in his name, on his name, that's Jesus Christ, what he has done, that he shed his blood, and that his blood shed was for the forgiveness of your sins. That's number one. And you have to receive him as well. In Revelation we find the scripture, uh, where Jesus stands outside and he knocks on the on the on the door of the heart, and whoever lets him in, he will come in and he will dine with him, and and obviously it's figurative speech, but at the same time it's literal speech as well. Um, obviously you don't hear somebody you know knocking on your heart with a, a piece of wood. Maybe you do. Yeah, I'm not not sort of um, saying it's not the case, but you know what is meant. Yeah. Um, if you fall in love, um, you can sometimes see that a woman is or a man is knocking at the door of your heart, and you you let him in, you let him into into your heart, you know, into the most intimate parts of your life. And this is what God wants as well. You want He wants to be part of your life, and He wants you to receive Him, to open your heart to Him, to receive Him, and to believe on His name. That is very important. And why is it important? Because we are all sinners. We we don't stand up. You know, in this this battle of good and evil, we have already lost because sin is in our lives. And and it's not a question of the good outweighing the evil. It's not like if I've murdered five people, but I've saved the lives of six people, I'm okay. You're still condemned because for the wrong you've done, you know, murdering five people. Um, and you cannot be outweighed by, you know, rescuing six people from jumping off the cliff or something. Um, so you need forgiveness and you need righteousness and this righteousness and this forgiveness is provided through what Jesus has done that the one without sin paid the price for your sin and um, and then it says here that you were not born of blood or the will of the flesh or not the will of man but of God you were born of God this is comes the whole idea of being born again being born from above and that is the key and key message in the gospel of of John, that we need, to be, we need to be born again. We need to be a new creation in Christ. Paul calls it that whosoever is in Christ, see all is new, the old is gone, and all is new. Yeah, all is new. And it's, it's, it's a key, the key to becoming a Christian. Once you are there, and, and you are forgiven, and you are washed clean by the blood of Christ, God looks at you, and all he sees is just his son, his son Jesus Christ, and his righteousness on you. He doesn't see your sin. He doesn't see all the, the stuff you've done wrong in your life, but he sees the righteousness of Christ. And then uh, he pours out his Holy Spirit into your life. And we can see this at Pentecost, you know, where the church was born on Pentecost. And you can see this in the book of Acts. And And once, you know, you are there, you've got the Spirit of God in your life. And with that, you've got the light of life in your life. I mean, Jesus even said, you know, when he was here, obviously, he was not omnipresent, you know, through the Father, I'm sure he was, but in himself he wasn't. He could only talk to, you know, the people, whoever he was, you know, in the locality in Israel. He couldn't talk to the Romans at the same time he was in Jerusalem. I'm sure he could if he wanted to, but God imposed this limit on himself to, to do this and to be that limited. Now... Jesus said that he was glad that he was going to go after his resurrection, that he wasn't sticking around. He said because he would ask the Father, and the Father would send the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. And this is sort of the amazing thing about Christianity, that you can have the light of life in your life right now, today. And and the important thing what we need to do is, is I'm not sure how to say this and, and not to sound irreverent, but it's, is to cultivate this relationship with God, to cultivate this relationship with the Holy Spirit. And I'm not talking about, um, about, you know, being 
enthusiastically jumping around and and um getting overly excited or anything like that what i'm talking about is just the still quiet voice of god in your life you know where you reach out to god and you just invite him in your life and you say lord i want you in my life and i father i pray for the holy spirit in my life i pray for the holy spirit revealing your truth to me and jesus said himself you know even though you are evil know how to give good gifts to your children how much more will the father give you the holy spirit if you ask him for it this is what jesus said and and this is something which I think is the the great news of the New Testament that that you can walk with God and that God is with you and you can be guided by the Holy Spirit in these days in two thousand and eighteen you know, or nineteen or seventeen whenever you hear this obviously seventeen is in the past but uh, two thousand eighteen two thousand nineteen two thousand whatever yeah but right now wherever you are right now you can experience the Holy Spirit and you can experience God through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And this is something absolutely amazing. And and this is where where you know God isn't trying to blind you like the the truck that was uh, coming on this dark road. He's just trying to lead you into truth and he's giving you as much truth as you can take it. He's not going to try and destroy you, but he's trying to to help you, to lead you into into an understanding, into the truth. Going back to the darkness, there's a lot of darkness around us. You know, people make up uh, false signs, there's false media. Um, you know, there's a lying media out there. There's uh, a scientific approach which is based on atheism. They don't want to know about God. Um, there are a lot of false religions, even within Christianity. There are a lot of false movement, false brethren, and it makes it very difficult. And it's it's very hard to navigate through this 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 world of falseness. And uh, and yet. There's one way how you can safely navigate through the whole madness, through the darkness that is going going on around us, and that is by throwing yourself upon the mercy of God, by accepting Jesus Christ in your life, by trusting in the in the totality of his sacrifice for your sins and for your life, and in inviting and asking the Father to pour out the Holy Spirit into your life so that uh, that you can see the truth that you can walk in the light and not in darkness, and that spiritually you are sorted, that you can see what is good and what is wrong. And if there are teachers rising up and they are just false teachers, that you can see that they are false teachers, not because of your level of intelligence. Yeah. And then spiritually, uh, it's it's totally different. I mean, even the most intelligent people spiritually don't get it right. But it's to do with just following God and being directed by God himself, you know, in this crazy world. And we need this so very much. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I, I just want to thank you that you have given us a light in Christ and that you have given us total forgiveness and total righteousness in Jesus Christ that we can come to you and humbly ask you to pour out your Holy Spirit into our lives so that we can walk in the light and not in the darkness. I pray, Lord, that you will that you will open our eyes, that we can see, that we can discern I pray, Lord, that you will protect us from, from all the, the errors in this world, you know, even within Christianity. We pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, this was a presentation from the Christian War Room. You can <clears throat> um, go to www.christianwarroom.com. Www. Try again. www.christianwarroom.com. And you can find a lot more talks, you know, in this area. Uh, so check it out if you've got some time. Uh, this particular talk, if you want to download it or listen to it again, is talk number 224.